welcome to Empire with me, Anita Arnand. And me, William Drimple. Applause for the pause. <laughs> well, well done, you. Uh, look, wasn't last week fabulous? Peter Frankopan. Oh, Frankamanka. Frankamanka really knocked it out of the park. <laughs> wasn't he? He was just fabulous and took us over two episodes through the collapse of Byzantium and the beginning of the story that we have been, um, you know, really excited to tell you, which is the Ottoman Empire. He has this extraordinary range. What was interesting was seeing, in a sense, all three of his books coming into play. We had a little bit of Adakamina, The First Crusade, and his first wonderful book, The Call from the East, uh, which was the first book of his I read. And I remember inviting him to Jaipur long before he became the famous Peter Frankopan of the Silk Roads to talk about crusades. And we, first of all, bonded on stage talking about uh, a wonderful Arab memoirist called Zama Ibn Munkwid, who uh, he had written about. And anyway, it was, he, he was wonderful on that. Then you had a bit of the Silk Roads and his theories about nomadic peoples coming in and uh, uh, and the Seljuks. And, and he told you off. He told me off several times. Yes, I know. My mother really enjoyed that, by the way. Olive enjoyed it too. <laughs> Olive, Olive says, he put you in your place, didn't he? That's what, that's what my mother said. She goes, who is this Peter? Peter Frankopan. He's, he's very funny. He kept telling you two you were wrong. <laughs> and she was saying it with such glee. Thanks, Mum, if you're no, listening. It's true. Well, he told me I was wrong rather more than he told you. It was honest. Well, anyway. I think that's as it should be. He is, he is a professor <laughs> at both Oxford and Cambridge, so he's allowed to tell Yeah, he's allowed to do that. Uh, but anyway, listen, th- this week we are coming to a subject that you have lobbied hard for, and no wonder it's such an interesting subject. I have been lobbying hard for this, and it's the cusp between two empires, in fact, rather than just one. And it's the moment of the fall of Constantinople, 1453, and the birth, in a sense, of the Ottoman Empire. These were the two crucial empires which dominated between them the Middle East for for 1,500 years. There's a special reason for that. This is a a book of the same name, The Fall of Constantinople, 1453, by a man who really was your sort of your your animal guide, your spirit guide. <laughs> I don't know how to call him, but he is your um your Not sure you welcome that particular. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us about Runciman and why he matters so much to you. Who who is this man? So this man is Sir Stephen Runciman, uh, who. I discovered traveling around the Middle East as a backpacker uh, when I was sort of 18, 19, 20. And it was really his books which made me want to become a historian. Uh, He wrote a famous and extraordinary three-volume history of the Crusades. Uh, He wrote a whole series of books about the history of Byzantium, which when he started writing in the 1930s was considered still to be a sort of uh, a terrible degenerate form of, uh, of what had been the great classical Roman Empire. And at that period, in the aftermath of of Gibbon and the very uh, negative views about Byzantium put out by Enlightenment thinkers, everyone looked down on this as a very dark and degenerate phase of the old Roman Empire. And Runciman was part of the extraordinary generation of historians that reconsidered this whole chunk of world history. Uh, and he wrote a whole series of books, the last and, to my mind, the greatest of which, and, and my favorite history book, full stop, was The Fall of Constantinople, which sees this extraordinary moment of cusp. Constantinople, of course, modern Istanbul, is a city straddled between Europe and Asia. It sits on the dividing line, on the Bosphorus, between the two continents. Uh, but it's also very much the cusp between two different cities. Uh, Byzantium, the, the, the Greek capital, founded by ancient Greek merchants and sailors uh, between the Golden Horn and the Sea of Marmara on the Hellespont, which then became for Constantine, the capital of New Rome, and the as the Roman Empire in the West is beginning to look more and more shaky, it first becomes a double capital with Rome and then becomes the last surviving bit of the Roman Empire after the Western Empire collapses and, and Rome falls. And Runciman, as his greatest work, wrote this short but beautiful book about the moment that that city finally falls after many, many sieges by Arabs, Persians, Vikings, Avars, and uh, every imaginable sort of assailant. It's finally the great Ottoman Turkish army in 1453 
uh, that does for the city. And you have in this book, Runciman was a wonderful figure for for summoning up human beings. He he was, to my mind, the greatest narrative historian of our time. Uh, apart from the sublime writing, and you're absolutely right, because you rather airily said, <laughs> so gave me 24 hours, read Runciman's book, uh, which I did. And, I, and I, I thought it would be a chore, but it was an absolute delight. But then I fell into the rabbit hole of Runciman's life. <laughs> and just, just before you go on with um, with the subject matter, can I, I don't even know if you know about this, uh, but do you know his school friends included Cyril Connolly, George Orwell, and Puffin Asquith. First of all, his name is Puffin Asquith, who's the Prime Minister's son. I didn't know there was such a person as Puffin Asquith. I Puffin Asquith. That. I just feel that we ought to mark the fact that there was a Puffin Asquith and he went to school with your hero. Uh, and he got a full scholarship to Trinity. This is Puffin or this is, this is Runciman? No, this is your, your man Runciman. Your man, your grand Runciman. Um, but, but also he went. Well, he got a full scholarship to go to Trinity. And one of his best mates was Cecil Beaton, who took pictures of him with a parrot on his finger. There is a famous picture of him Amazing. with a parrot, exactly. Yeah, as, as this rather sort of beautiful, loose young man wearing a sort of uh, Japanese kimono in this picture, as I remember. Yes, that's right. And that, that was actually, you know, the Japanese kimono in the very fashionable French wallpaper was his student digs, yeah. which just really <laughs> marked him out already from the beginning uh, as something quite unusual. And again, you know, he's very much that part of that generation. He was tutored to no less than Guy Burgess. The, uh, the, oh, yes. The... <laughs> yes. Do you know what he said about Burgess when he was asked later? I mean, honestly, you really have eaten up most of my day just going down rabbit holes here. So thank I you for that. I don't know any of this. Go on. Carry yes, on. Yes, okay. So what did he say about Guy Burgess? <laughs> he said uh, he had intellectual brilliance and very dirty fingernails. <laughs> So, so we ought to say Guy Burgess was a notorious spy here, for those of you who don't know. But had very dirty fingernails, who knew? But apparently exactly. had very, very dirty fingernails. But I love this kind of observation of the very, very small and the very, very large and grand, which also informs the writing. And I think, you know, he writes, actually, I can totally see why he formed who you are, because he writes the way you do. He builds enormous landscapes with small figures. Well, I've, I've modelled my writing on him. I, can I just read? I wrote something about him when I was, I suppose, about 19, after I first went to see him, because he lived, funny enough, not, in, not very far from where I lived. I grew up in Scotland. And uh, he retired from Cambridge because he wanted to write. He decided, you know, he didn't really want to teach. He wanted to write. And, and Guy Burgess's fingernails and other things obviously put him off yes. <laughs> entirely from the, 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 the business of, of being a Don. And he decided that he was, that his talent was writing. And, and I'm very glad that he took the decision. He went off to a tower house in Scotland and sat there writing these extraordinary books. But before that, he'd lived this extraordinary life. And that's what I wrote in this piece, aged 19. Mm. Stephen Runciman, who until his death lived in a tower house in the Scottish borders, was a most undonish don. He's been besieged by Manchu warlords in the city of Tianjin, but escaped to play a piano duet with the last emperor of China. He has lectured Ataturk on Byzantium and be made a grand orator of the great church of Constantinople, which is New Rome. He smoked a hooker with the grand Chelebi Effendi of the Whirling Dervishes, and by reading their tarot cards, correctly predicted the death of King George II of the Hellenes and Fuad, last king of Egypt. Anyway, it goes on like this, but I was very dazzled by this guy who'd been everywhere. I mean, everyone, You totally were, yeah. But like most people who write about sieges, he'd actually been in one. I mean, how many of us have actually been in a siege? What what I found utterly charming about it, I mean, apart from the fact you age ni uh, 19, uh, stroke 20, <laughs> writing about Runciman, it is basically, I love him. I really love him. I really, really love him. Um, but you miss out. I want to be him. I, <laughs> my friend, he would be proud of you today. Let me just tell you, honestly, 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 I can totally see how this is a continuity, uh, Runciman in you. And he really is sublime. I mean, but but one thing that you missed out, and again, I'm, I'm just delighting in the fact that I can tell you stuff. You found all sorts of stuff. I, have, <laughs> I didn't know any of this. Exactly. That's why the journalism <laughs> the historian thing works, my friend. Did you know he was an honorary whirling dervish? I didn't. Because <laughs> he was. Actually, he was an honorary. Again, I should give up trying to be like him. I, I've never, well, I mean, I think there's still time. <laughs> I mean, I've seen you. I've seen you throw shapes on a dance floor. <laughs> There's still time, William. Um, and also, I mean, you're in love with him, but you've also given me the love of my life now by accident. Uh, because uh, so, William, you are very annoying. So, like, just 24 hours ago, before we were recording, you just sort of loftily went read Runciman. You were coming out of a plane at this. I was point. coming off an aeroplane, honestly. <laughs> 
You're very lucky you're in India because if I could throw something, I would have done. No, I could tell. I could tell it wasn't a remark that went down well by the silence which followed. No, no, it really, it really wasn't. I was trying to get my cabin down, and then there is, you know, the Emperor Dalrymple going, "Oh, just find his book, darling. It's marvelous." Um, but anyway, I found something even better. Who has given me my spirit animal? Who is a man called Nathan Kennett, who does the audio version of his book? <laughs> and let me tell you about. The, the, I mean, this is all a bit of a sidebar, but it's just delightful. He is the love child, Nathan Kennett, of Yul Brynner, Richard Burton, George V, and Orson Welles. Because <laughs> this oh, is an yeah. accent you have never heard before in your life. Where did you find this on Audible? No, no, I did a deep dive on the internet and I found him on YouTube. But he refers to, I mean, he's reading Ransom and Your, Your Hero, which is already beautiful, but he reads it in this most spectacular way, talking about the authorities, ambassadors, each sad thought itself to be taking defensive action. I mean, honestly, it's a, it's, I can neither place the geography nor the time. I'm going to go straight onto YouTube after we finish this recording and hear this. So gorgeous. I'm sorry, I've said you haven't told me before. I loved it. No, no, I thought I'd save it up for right now, but I'm in love with Nathan Kennett. But anyway, together, Nathan Kennett and your man Runciman, Stephen Runciman have eaten my day. Um, Right. Shall we get into the meat of the matter now? Shall we get into 1453 itself and why this siege is so very, very important? William, why does it mark one of the most important chapters of history in this part of the world? Well, if you think of all the different kingdoms and empires that have come and gone across the history of Europe, bizarrely, the history of the Middle East only really has two empires, which take us from... Well, I suppose the Battle of Actium, you know, 50 BC, to the First World War in 1914. And Byzantium and then the Ottomans successively hold that entire arc of the world during that enormous long period of history. And the one break is 1453, when Byzantium goes down and the Ottomans take their capital for their own. So, I mean, just just to remind you, those of you who haven't listened to the the Frankopan episodes that we keep banging on about, they're really, really good. Go back and listen to them. Stop what you're doing and go back and listen to them. But if you haven't, he painted a very beautiful picture of a dying city. So it's a city of, of vineyards and fields. It has shrunk from a million strong in the 12th century down to 100,000 people. Money is running short. And uh, it really is a problem, isn't it, financing? Because... Um, the crowns even, they've prized out gemstones, William, and put in glass instead. That sort of tells you, doesn't it, what kind of situation they're facing. I'm going to ask this several times over the course of, of the next hour, but can I read a bit of Ransom? <laughs> yes, of course you can. Of course you can. This is the some of the opening passages of uh, the fall of Constantinople, and it's Ransom's description uh, of the de- decaying city Um which had once been the greatest city on earth, and now was this. Despite the brilliance of its scholars, Constantinople, by the close of the 14th century, was a melancholy, dying city. The population which, with that of the suburbs, had numbered about one million in the 12th century, had shrunk now to more than 100,000 and was still shrinking. The suburbs across the Bosphorus were already in Turkish hands. Pira, across the Golden Horn, was a Genoese colony. Of the suburbs along the Thracian shore and the Bosphorus and the Marmara, once studded with splendid villas and rich monasteries, only a few hamlets were left, clustering around some ancient church. The city itself, within 14 miles of encircling walls, had, even in its greatest days, been full of parks and gardens, dividing the various quarters. But now many quarters had disappeared and fields and orchards separated those that remained. The traveller Ibn Battuta in the mid-14th century counted 13 distinct townlets within the walls. At the south end of the city, the buildings of the old imperial palace were no longer habitable. The last Latin emperor in his extremity, after selling off most of the city's holy relics to St. Louis, and before pawning his son and heir to the Venetians, had stripped the lead off all the roofs and disposed of them for cash. Neither Michael Paleologus nor any of his successors had ever had enough money to restore them. Only a few of the churches were maintained within its grounds, such as the Nea Basilica of Basil I and the Church of the Mother of God at the Pharos. Nearby, the Hippodrome was crumbling. Young men of the nobility used the arena to play polo. 
across the square, the patriarchal palace still contained the patriarch's offices, but he no longer ventured to reside there. Only the great cathedral of holy wisdom of God, Santa Sophia, was still splendid, and its upkeep was the special charge of state revenues. So you get this impression of this city with this huge extent, which had once enclosed a million people and the richest churches and the richest palaces. And now it's sort of reduced to a few remaining areas of habitation surrounded by vineyards and gardens and fields. Can I tell you a little side tidbit story? Because you know how I like those. You mentioned Ibn Battuta. <laughs> you know how I love I my did. tidbits. <laughs> there is, a, I, I'm trying to find, I was sort of rifling through it. It's one of, one of the things I have been reading in the period. But Ibn Battuta, when he first goes to uh, Constantinople, is told, because he speaks Arabic, of course, and they don't in the city. <laughs> yeah. and they still speak Greek. So he's taken to a man who has been paid a lot of money by the palace to be a translator into Arabic. And Ibn Battuta talks to him, and the man just shrugs at him and looks quite panicky, and then is sort of prodded, and then starts talking some garbage back. <laughs> and Ibn Battuta again says, "What the hell are you doing? What is this? You know." And it, it turns out this man has been taking money as a translator. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that the best story ever? He's been taking money quite happily and has not one idea of Arabic, but has been making quite a lot of money as, a, as an story. Arabic translator on standby. Anyway, it was my favourite Ibn Battuta story. But back to our story. Um, so look, it's in, it's in a parlour state. And, 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 and we have to sort of, again, just remind people why. This is a place, you know, that, that was once... Um, the queen of cities. The Vikings called it Mikkelgarth, the great city, and you have these and you have these great uh, descriptions by the Vikings coming when it's at its peak, and and they're just dazzled by this place, and they're let in only with sort of escorts because they're Vikings. <laughs> and, yes, uh, <laughs> don't, don't leave them unsupervised. You do want an unsupervised Viking. Wandering around, no, you do. I think I think that's actually quite good advice, even today. <laughs> and and then there's and then there's also these wonderful um, embassies, uh, I can't remember whether it's your friend uh, Leoprand of Cremona or someone else, who comes in. Yes, yes, Leoprand of Cremona, yeah, and is rude. <laughs> and it's rude about everybody. There's one occasion when, when he, one of the envoys goes in to see the emperor and he's sitting on his throne and the guy bows down. And when he looks up, the emperor has suddenly sprung up. They, they put some sort of mechanical contraption on the, on the throne and he's up in the air, 30 feet in the air on some sort of enormous joist. It's like a Cirque du Soleil kind yeah. of thing. <laughs> comes out of the <laughs> behold your emperor. But you know, look, I mean, that, that's all very glamorous. But uh, the reason, again, and we just backfill a little bit here, the reason why, you know, Runciman is able to write in, in in such a moving way about the terrible state of affairs is because this is a place that's been hammered. You know, from the east, you've got tribal raiders. From the west, you've got these economic pressures. You've got, you know, thanks to crusaders who've been sent by Rome to have a little divert looting in the city. This is a place that's been kind of brought to its knees. And is now surrounded. The, 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 the Ottomans have gone way out into uh, as far as the Danube. And so it's just this little Byzantine island surrounded by Ottomans on all sides. So obviously its days are numbered. Yeah, I think, I think they, yes, that's right. They only have a few outlying places, a bit of the Peloponnese and the city. That's yeah, it. That's all exactly. they have now. So, okay, so now the emperor, Michael Palaiologos, is in trouble. And he needs allies to help him push back against this, this Ottoman ambition. And there is a reason that the Ottomans really want this city. I mean, first of all, it is often referred to as the bone in the throat of Allah, that all of the areas around it are for Islam. Also, I mean, there's, a, there's an ancient story about the standard bearer for the prophet died in the city and therefore it is a holy city and it is only a matter of time before it's reclaimed. So he feels, the emperor, Michael, feels very strongly and quite rightly that this pressing in is not going to stop now at the gates. It, they're going to come in. So what does he do? He goes on this great search around Western Europe looking for allies and he goes to he goes to Italy, he goes to France, he even comes to England. And he spends Christmas Day at the Palace of Eltham, the most unlikely thing a Byzantine emperor coming to coming to Britain in fourteen hundred. I incidentally, you know, I met his descendant uh, running a Did supermarket you? to the Peloponnese this autumn. <laughs> I mean, really? Actually, the last of the Paleologa lives in Cardamilly and he runs he runs a supermarket. Did he just tell you he was or was he genuinely? <laughs> was he, he genuinely not? was. No, really? I, he was he was dis his father I think was was first written about by Patrick Lee Fermor, uh, who moved to Cardamilly 
uh, and uh, he was pointed out to me that that's where the last uh, that's where the last Paleologus lives. He, he runs a supermarket. <laughs> that's amazing. Um, so, would it be a stretch to say? And I, I can't remember if Peter Frankopan did say this, but you know that kind of um, desperate tour of, of Europe looking for allies. What did he say, or, or am I just imagining that it's a little bit like Zelensky nowadays going all over the place saying, "Help me, help me." The wolves are at the gate. You've got to help me. It's very like that. But the the difference is that that, that it's very, he has to do just one thing to get all the assistance he needs, and that is to convert to Catholicism. Because these two great churches have been now separated for 400 years. since The great schism. The great schism. Since the 11th century, the Orthodox Church is no longer on, on, on speaking terms with the Catholic Church. And all the Catholic powers in Europe say, we'll help you, we'll send ships, we'll send galleys, we'll send everything you need, just convert to Catholicism. And of course, he can't do that because all his people would just overthrow him. And then there's the, in 1439, there's the Council of Florence, when the whole of the Byzantine church hierarchy goes to Florence and they attempt to bring about a union in order that, to allow the aid to come on in. And I think they agreed to have union, but by the time they get back home, uh, the people in, in Constantinople reject it, particularly the, mon- the monks of Mount Athos won't have it. Uh, and so it never comes into effect. And so the great crusade to to rescue Byzantium never happens. And they're more or less on their own uh, as the Ottomans close in. And, and the thing is, the Ottomans are closing in. And even that is interesting because the Ottomans have tried this before. They've tried to take the city before and they failed. In fact, it is the father of the current sultan who has tried this and embarrassed himself in, in the past. It's been a, a moment Correct. of great humiliation. I mean, just tell us about that first attempt to take the city by the Ottomans. Well, R- Runciman said there were 100,000 at this time. I've read in, in, in books written since then that I think the estimates today are that it, there was half that. There are only 50,000 left in the walls of Constantinople. But we're talking about 1422, right? This is the, yes. this is the first time that exactly. they try and take the city, the Ottomans. Uh-huh. And yet at that time, even then, although there's, you know, there's virtually no no one left in the city enough to put a proper army out to fight. Uh, still, the Ottomans can't get in the walls because not only is the city defended by the greatest walls, city walls ever built, the great Theodosian land walls, there's amazing sea walls. And then there's this fantastic boom that they put across the Golden Horn, this chain that they can, that they can put, which, uh, which stops warships getting in. So by land and by sea. Now, when you say chain, you see, you say it as if it makes complete sense, but you're talking about an absolutely bloody great, I mean, it is a chain made of links and metal that is what just strung along the harbour. How does it work, the great chain? From, from one side to the other, and, and they can winch it up and block any ship coming in. And I believe it's still in the Naval Museum in Istanbul. I remember seeing in guidebooks it being, there's a bit, a few links of this chain still surviving. So okay, so it's got it's got it's got this great chain, but also we should sort of um, remind people that it's also it's fortified by this amazing triple wall structure. Um, do, do you want to talk about that? I mean, that that also is fascinating. Well, this is built way back in the fifth century by the Emperor Theodosius II, and it's one of the great masterpieces of ancient engineering, right up there with what what, what Hagia Sophia is for uh, for. Uh, ecclesiastical architecture, in other words, the very greatest church ever built until the Renaissance. Uh, So the Theodosian land walls are to city defences. And it's an amazingly sophisticated system of of walls and and, uh, ditches and uh, floodable moats. Uh, And it has kept out everyone that has tried to attack the city uh, since the since the fifth century, so it's it's an incredibly impregnable city. So even though the Ottomans have this vast army, and even though there are no almost no Byzantines left, and even the monks don't make up uh, fifty thousand people if if you include them, uh, still uh, it can hold on. But then comes along our man Mehmet the second. Well, this is a good point to take a break. So let's take a break and then join us after the break when we come and introduce you to the man who will change everything. Mehmet the second. Welcome back. Just before the break, we had tantalizingly shown you a glimpse of the man who really matters in all of this, Mehmet the second. Well, here's Runciman's description of him. I love this. He was handsome, of middle height, but strongly built. His face was dominated by a pair of piercing eyes under arched eyebrows 
and a thin hooked nose that curved over a mouth with full red lips. In later life, his features reminded men of a parrot about to eat ripe cherries. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. Okay, so we know what we're getting with him. Uh, We haven't actually done justice to the man who's facing him on the opposite side, and that's Constantine the 11th, the last of the Paleologuses. What was he like? Was He He was much older, wasn't he? He was much older. Mehmet II was was only 20. I mean, you know, he wouldn't have even have Gosh, got he a, a boy. He yeah. wouldn't be allowed to drink in America uh, by the time he captured Constantinople. Um, while, yes, Constantine the 11th Paleologus was 48. Uh, and he was this, he, I mean, he is the man to fill the role. He is your archetypal sort of bulldog who uh, uh, is, looks very good in a suit of armor and is prepared to fight to the end. He's not an intellectual. He's not a great, he's not a great theologian. Uh, he's not renowned for his patronage of the arts or anything like that. But he is the man of the moment who can rally his troops as the Ottomans come close. I mean, he has a tactical mind. He's a soldier's soldier soldier, in a way. So the first thing, rather than sort of now looking out for help that that may not come and in historical experience doesn't come, they get nice words when they go to Elton, but they don't actually get much help. Um, He starts to fortify the city. So he does that first of all, doesn't he, by by gathering all the city arms together and looking to the walls, which have fallen. I mean, they're old walls, aren't they, William? And they've been standing for quite a long time. Well, they've been around since the 5th century. So they're almost a 1,000 years old. And he repairs them, he gathers all the cities, and he raises the famous chain. So the chain now blocks the entrance to the Golden Horn. But they then do a quick head count. And they've got these, what is it, 15 miles of walls? And they do a count, and to their horror, they find that there's only 4,983 adult troops in the city. Crumbs. And marching towards them are 300,000 Ottomans. Imagine that. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's it's not fair. Extraordinary. <laughs> it's extraordinary. it's not fair. It is this sort of Tolkien-like moment. <laughs> it is. And, and I love this. I love this uh, also. You know, when they've done the head count, 4,983 4, adult troops, including monks. <laughs> <laughs> How useful are your monks? <laughs> are these fighting monks? I think they must be fighting monks. They're certainly they included. They must be fighting monks. Fight, yeah. Swinging a chasuble, maybe, doing a lasso <laughs> over their heads with a, or clogging you over the head with a cross. One ally, though, that will make a huge difference, the Genoese, because they have historically been useful before. They've stood by Correct. the uh, Byzantine leadership before, and they will do again. And this kind of. So there is a reason for this is that when Constantinople fell at the Fourth Crusade, the people pushing that were the Venetians. And when Constantinople was recaptured, uh, at, at the end of the Latin Kingdom, the Venetians are banished because they're the baddies in this story. And of course, they're great, the, the Venetians' great uh, enemies and allies of the Byzantines are the Genoese. So the Genoese get Pyrrha just over the Golden Horn, and they get their own little colony, and they are the last sort of lifeline. And Genoa does send 700 men under, under a, a fantastic general called Giustiani Longo. And so there's just just 7,000 foreign allies at this vital moment when they need the whole of Europe to come and ride to their defense. There's just 7,000. But there's also, and this is one of my favorite details, there's a Scottish engineer called John Grant who turns up and he's a mining expert. What the hell is he doing over there? (laughs) No idea what he's doing here. Uh, um, He's come via Germany. And he is useful because when the, it, it, during the siege, when, as in all medieval sieges, there is mining activity and people try to undermine the walls, uh, John Grant leads the countermine uh, and he mines under the miners uh, and manages to, there's a famous moment when he actually manages to break into the Ottoman uh, mining operations and, and, and kill all the troops in there. So there's a Scot, the Scots and the Genoese are the, the only two allies left to the, these poor 5,000, uh, uh, including monk uh, Byzantines. Yeah. So, but also, we, I mean, just to say, you know, there, there is this, this charismatic figure doesn't do it justice because Justiniani Longo is, and I'm just trying to think of the equivalent, it's like the talismanic player who comes on at half time is going to score the goals that bring you back. He is, I mean, it's almost as if people think he's got mystical powers, this man in warfare. 
he obviously was very charismatic and uh, his arrival, despite the fact he's only brought 700 men, and this is the, 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 the total number of allies that appear uh, to, to try and save this doomed city. Despite the fact that he's only got 700, it's a big deal because he's this huge charismatic figure and he seems to rally uh, everyone, uh, people are people are thrilled. He makes that he's them braver, there. doesn't he? He shouts, and they're they're terrified. They see these, you know, masses of troops um, that are, they're heading for them with their with their drums and their you know Kettle fires drums. by night. Yeah, exactly. Yes, I mean they, they they the Ottomans aren't stealthy about coming to the walls, and they want to make their presence known. And they well, want if you've got three hundred thousand men, it's quite difficult to be stealthy. The air would be yeah. reverberating. You'd you know you'd almost sort of smell the smoke from their their fires and their torches. And you would just feel your heart beating to the the rhythm of their drums. That's how terrifying it must have been. And yet he is able to make people think they can hold the city. It's, it's an extraordinary power. And and so there's two different armies converging on the city. There's the Ottoman army in Europe, because remember by this stage, the Ottomans have gone way over uh, to uh, into what's now Eastern Europe, uh, the Danube. Uh, and so this enormous army of uh, of between 150,000 and 300,000 troops come from the west to the land walls. But the first really sinister sign that something is up comes even before that, on the 15th of April, 1452, when the Ottomans coming from the east, from the Anatolian side, from the Asian side, cross the Bosphorus into Byzantine territory and without asking permission or announcing themselves, they build their own fortress on the Byzantine side of the Bosphorus. And this is still there today. It's a gorgeous round fortress called Rumeli Hassar. If you dri- drive up from Bebek, uh, you can see it. Uh, but at the time, it's just known as the Straight Cutter. Boyaz Kessen, the straight cutter. So, I mean, it's effectively cutting them off. That, is that why it's called the straight cutter? Because it exactly just separates that. them, severs them from the rest of supply lines, any kind of troop movements. They are cut off from the back. And no one is allowed to pass past this castle without permission from the castle keepers, from the Ottomans in it. And a couple of Genoese ships try to run the gauntlet. And the Ottomans demonstrate their mastery of artillery by sinking the ship immediately. One shot does it. Wow. The ship goes down. Now, listen, I'm glad you've mentioned artillery because we cannot talk about this siege without talking about... We, it's time to roll out the big gun, <laughs> the really, really, really big gun, um, because this is the super gun that is going to make an enormous amount of difference to those impregnable walls. And by the way, I forgot to tell you that ever since those walls were created in the 5th century, there were reports from those people living in Constantinople that whenever the city was under threat, Theodicus herself, the mother of God, would be on those walls fighting, you know, in full armor, fighting against the enemy. And so, you know, the people inside really believed they had a divine right to win and that you know Mary mother of God would protect them but they haven't reckoned for the workmanship of a man called Orban tell us about Orban the Hungarian well oh, the, the big thorn in the side of, of the Christian armies is called Orban the Hungarian now in some of the older sources they call him Urban but it must be the same name as our as the current Victor Orban which has a certain irony but I actually found enough, I had a I had a couple of hours with Orban in Hungary this summer yeah, the Victor one Victor I was I was oh. giving a lecture in Budapest and I got summoned to the palace. And he, he's, he, he likes history. He's, he's a very keen historian, but he hates Muslims. And he's one of the great Islamophobes of, of, of modern politics. And his whole pitch is that uh, we're going to be drowned by Muslims coming from the East. So the fact that it was his ancestor or someone with the same name as him who actually designed the super gun that destroyed the walls of Constantinople is a rather nice historical irony. And helped the Ottomans in. I mean, did, did you tell him? Because I'm sure... I didn't know it then, when but him. Did you tell him? You, didn't, oh. no, you should just... write to him and say, you know what? You know that thing that we met? <laughs> <laughs> and another thing. P.S. Um, anyway, okay, so tell us about this great gun maker um, who may or not be related to the present Orban, but certainly was a very famous uh, metal worker of his time. Exactly. And it's a terrible story because Orban the Hungarian actually offered his services, first of all, to the Byzantines. And he went and said, I can build the biggest gun in the world. It'll keep the Ottomans at bay. Uh, I'm your man. And the Byzantines said, we'd love to, but we're, we're, we haven't any cash. We're broke. We've, read, we've broke. already taken the oh, lead no. off the roofs. We've taken, we've taken the diamonds out of the crowns. It's all gone. We can't pay you. By all means, build us a gun, but we can't pay you for it. 
<laughs> and then he said, no, well, why would I do that? Why would I be building you a gun for free? Said Orban. Yeah. And so Orban the Hungarian goes off and he goes to the Ottomans and says, can I build you the biggest gun in the world to knock down the walls of Constantinople? And of course, Mehmet II says, yes, please. And he puts unlimited resources at Orban's feet. And, and on the 5th of April, the army is finally in place. And on the 6th of April, 1453, this super gun fires for the first time. And the from within the walls, they, they report this, there's a blast and a crash like thunder from heaven. And poor old Longo, who is uh, Justiniani Longo, who is, you know, the, the star midfielder who can turn the match around, is looking at this going, I don't know what to do. So one thing that they do do, which is, so, I mean, it's sort of, so hopeful over um, practical is that they start attaching bales of hay to the walls. Bales of wool, even better. Bales even of better. wool. So bales of wool. Yeah. So, that the, so that these enormous cannonballs, and we're talking, I mean, I don't think we've actually done justice to how big this gun is. How many people have to move this gun, William? It's so enormous. I, I mean, I've had 60 oxen had to move it, um, or, or uh, you know, uh, uh, almost a thousand men on either side. I've read, I mean, there, there are all sorts of hyperbole about how heavy this gun is to move into position, and that the shot is so very heavy, it can only fire a couple of times a day because it's just such an involved thing. I've, I've got my copy of Runciman to, 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 to hand here. The length of its barrel was estimated to be 40 spans. That is 26 feet and six inches. So it's an enormous gun. It's an enormous And heavy. Gun. And heavy. Heavy, The heavy, balls heavy. were said to weigh 1,200 weight. Not much what that heavy. is. So, <laughs> heavy. I mean, I don't Sorry, know. Heavy. Sounds really... But thank you for, thank you for reading it out. <laughs> it's heavy. Um, so bales of wool that they then sort of dangle on the outside of the walls are going to make absolutely no difference at all. And they're hoping that these balls are going to boing off, but they don't at and all. And it says that the first ball, uh, with that thunder crash, hurtled through the air for a mile, then buried itself six feet deep in the earth. And people have never seen this before. I mean, these are the uh, this is the early days of of really serious artillery. Heavy artillery, yeah. Yeah, it's not a it's not a well known thing. And and there are you know there are many armies in the world in 1400 that don't have any artillery. And so the sight of this sort of the, you know the greatest gun ever built does put the defenders very much on edge. And then there's a couple of sort of rather terrifying moments. There's some uh, outlying fortresses on the edge of the walls. And the Janissaries, the, these, these crack troops, uh, are sent against them. And the Janissaries, just to remind people, are the, those young boys who've been taken from um, land that has been conquered by the Ottomans and taken away from their families and then raised as crack troops to be loyal unto the Ottomans until their dying breath. That's who they are. And, and they are ferocious fighters. And what happens to them? William, I interrupted just to remind people who they yeah, are. Yeah, so the, the outlying castle is called Therapia. Uh, and there are only uh, only 40 survivors uh, at the end of two days of attacks by the Janissaries. And they surrender unconditionally, hopeful that they're going to be treated well because they fought very bravely. Instead, they're put to death by impalement. They put stakes up and they just drop these people onto them alive. And it's one of the most hideous ways of dying. You take a, it's like sort of crucifixion. You take a long time to die and it's very, very painful. So first of all, what day one, you've had Orban, Orban, Victor Orban's gun. Uh, and then day two, you've seen your friends impaled en masse outside the walls. So things are getting a bit uncomfortable. And then there's an, then just after that, the Pope sends some grain ships. Better late than never. Better really. late than never. Yeah, no. yeah. He hasn't sent any, any, any soldiers, but he sends three grain ships. And this is kind of one of the crucial sort of scenes of the siege, because at this point, European ships are much taller than Ottoman ships. Ottoman ships are low in the water. They're manned by slave uh, rowers, you know, the, the, the famous sort of scene of, uh, uh, in, in all those movies of you know, some guy with a big kettle drum beating and all the people pulling their oars. So these Ottoman boats come out and try to capture the three papal grain ships. But the papal ships are much taller and they can shoot down. 
and there's no breeze. So the, 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 the papal boats just sort of stay there. They're, they're, they're open to attack. And all these Ottoman boats come out from the Asian side of the Bosphorus and try and pull these, these three papal ships towards the Asian shore. And for two hours, fighting goes on. There's lots of heroic firing down from the European ships onto the Ottoman galleys below them. And then just as evening comes, there's that evening breeze you get on the Mediterranean coast. And the sails of these three papal ships fill with air and they sail off and the chain is lowered and they sail into the Golden Horn. And this is one of the kind of great moments of hope for the defenders because they've now got enough enough grain to see them through and they've seen the Ottoman navy defeated. And I must say, I mean, you know, look, those of you who are listening, who are getting quite cross and saying, hang on a minute, how come you're casting the Ottomans as the bad guys? No, no, we're not. The, the fact is that, you know, we're British and uh, the thing about the underdog <laughs> is something, and we know how this is going to end. So this is more pity than anything else, because this is not going well. I mean, if you are in Constantinople and you are watching all of this, the hope that you get from those grain ships is going to be pretty short lived, isn't it? Because tell us about the ditch, William, the filling of the ditch. They fill in the ditch in front of the Theodosian walls. They're moving slowly forward. They're getting closer to they the They being walls. the Ottomans. And, and again, can we give some credit to Mehmet? What a brilliant strategist he is, because this is total war. He's learned from the humiliation of his father that, you know, you do not go for Constantinople unless you're all in. And actually, it's sort of a master tactician, first of all, to put the money in, to get the troops out, to get the troops who are going to fight. You know, they're all on a register and they all have to show up. And if they don't show up, curtains for, for them. So there is a loyalty, a fighting force that is fit, unlike the headcount, inclu- including monks <laughs> that are inside. <laughs> 5,000, including yeah, monks. I know. And and this enormous gun, and then going around the back, and then setting up a fortress. I mean, this he's not messing around, is he, William? No, no, he's, he's thought about this. Although he's only 20, he's been thinking about this for two years. He's planned it meticulously. What a, but a brilliant mind on a twenty-year-old. I mean, you've got to you've got to think. Wow, that is just a a kid with barely it's just a gap stuff year on his chin. Exactly. A gap kid. Yes, exactly that. Exactly that. So okay, so they're filling in the ditch. So that means that they can then get breach that first defense, the the first wall. But the land walls are the land walls, and seven weeks later, no progress has been made. There's, uh, despite the gun, the, they managed to work at night and, and rebuild the gaps that appear. They managed to put up little palisades where previously the, a, a ball has struck and, and uh, created an enormous gash in the defenses. And after seven weeks, the chief vizier, Halil, who's this old guy, uh, who you know the twenty year old Mehmet looks up to, who was his father's vizier and has been around all his life, thirty years older than him. Halil goes to Mehmet and says, "You know, this is the same old story. We've all tried this many times. The Arabs tried it, the Persians tried it, the Vikings tried it, uh, the Avars tried it. Just call it off. This isn't going to work." And Mehmet says, "No." I'm not having this. And then he produces this masterstroke. And this is the thing that really, really alarms the Byzantines. Because up to now, they've had control of the Golden Horn, this, this strip, this, uh, this wonderful strip of sea that runs along the, the sea walls. And it's protected by the chain that we were talking about. And there's no way that the Ottomans can get into it and get close up. And then on the morning of the 22nd of April, an extraordinary sight greets the defenders. Mehmet has secretly built a road over the top of the hill, leading back down into the Golden Horn. And he's built a sort of railway. He's built a 15th century precursor to the railway. He put giant beams on the ground, greased with animal fat. And he manages to create a sort of harness using thousands of oxen. And he starts moving his galleys from the Bosphorus over the hill. Ships on wheels. Ships on wheels, William. This is insane. Ships on wheels. And not only are ships on wheels, but the the ships are full of sailors with their oars. and And their sails are up. So on the morning of the 22nd of April, the defenders are peering over the walls and they see these boats with their sails up coming down the hill towards them over land with the, the wind billowing in their sails and then plopping into the Golden Horn. So suddenly what had been their impregnable space is now an Ottoman lake. Uh, and they realize that things are, are, are getting serious for the first time. Yeah, and the, I mean, the sound of praying, I think there are people at the time just saying you know, that the, the, basically the city falls to its knees and says, 
we need we need God. We need God because we're not going to be able to withstand this much longer. But it's April, and of course there are portents. Uh, there is a torrential hail. Uh, there is uh, uh, an icon is dropped in Hagia Sophia. All these bad sort of omens begin begin to come. And on the Monday of the twenty eighth of May, which is about a month after these ships have gone into the Golden Horn, there's suddenly a day of complete silence. And this terrifies everybody because, in a sense, they got used to the booming of the of the super gun and, and all the the beating of the drums and all this sort of thing, and they are chilled by the fact that on the Monday there's no sound at all, and they wonder what does this mean? Complete silence. And this has happened just after the ditch has finally been successfully filled, so they know that you know the next thing is it's coming. It's coming. This storm, this Ottoman storm is about to break on them. And it does, doesn't it? It does. And the first thing is the night before, they can hear the guns being pulled forward over the filled-in ditch. Uh, and, and not just the super gun, but all the, 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 the vast Ottoman artillery is being pulled forward by slaves with oxen right up to the walls. So grinding and grunting and, you know, the sound of war just coming closer and closer. They can actually smell the, uh, uh, the, the oxen below them and they can hear them in the night before, then the Monday evening. Tuesday the 29th, the guns open at close point blank range and everyone realises this is it. And the bells in the city uh, all begin to ring, the last time that these bells will ring. And everyone's called to the front. And everyone realizes this is this is the last day. This is it. So there are successive armies, and the first one into action are the wonderfully named Bashi Bazooks. Well, that's uh, a good name. <laughs> yes. Tell us about the Bashi Bazooks. <laughs> Who are the Bashi Bazooks? The Bashi Bazooks are the sort of heavy metal bands of the of the Ottoman army. Uh, they're irregulars. There's three armies, each under a pasha, and each one has fifty thousand men. And one wave, then a second wave, then a third wave. Each of 50,000 comes at the walls. And to the amazement of the 5,000 defenders, they are pushed back. And at lunchtime, the Bashi Bazooks have made no progress. They, everyone is exhausted. The Bashi Bazooks retreat. And the Byzantines think for a moment, is this you know, have, have, have we beaten this? Is this it? Now? I mean, I, I read somewhere else, not in Ransom, but there was four hours of, of fighting, the most sort of brutal, almost sort of, you know, pushback fighting. And that this is, you know, just again, those people in the city suddenly go, can we do this? Can we do this? Can we really do this? Four hours later. And I just suddenly looked up, you know, you were looking up the weight of those, the cannon, because I just think, you know, it, it, you said something hundred weight and I, I'm sort of trying to do, I think it's 500 kilograms per ball. 500 kilograms coming at you. Just imagine that. And, and this gun, the urban gun or Orban gun, um, has a, a one kilometer reach on it. So there is power and pounding. And yet still, after this four hours of fighting, they have a moment. Can we really do this? Can we really do this? Can we survive this as well as the things and that we've survived in the past? Then what happens? Then the kettle drums strike up again. And this time, it's the Janissaries. And the Janissaries are the opposite of the Bashi Bazooks. The Bashi Bazooks are all over the place. They're, they're, they're not properly trained. They're wild men who've sort of turned up uh, wanting a share of the loot. And they're, basically, the Ottomans have used them to exhaust the defenders. And then at lunchtime, they bring on the Janissaries. And the Janissaries line up in perfect rank, and they march forward rank after rank after rank. Complete silence. Totally disciplined not a sound to be heard, and then they're off and they're heading for the walls. And that is kind of, you know, you can tell pretty well within 20 minutes that this is not going to end happily because they immediately um, managed to shoot Justiani, the Genoese general, and he gets a, a musket shot, bang. Yeah, the talismanic figure who can, who can make people brave and suddenly he gets hit, so all hope is gone. And not only does he get hit, he makes the fatal mistake, which wrecks his reputation uh, among Greeks to this day, of asking to be taken to his ship. For the last 
six months he's been on the walls rebuilding them uh, when they when the, when the gun goes off he's the man first into the hole to uh, organize a palisade and and fill it with sandbags or whatever they they fill the uh, the broken walls with he's been fighting off all the different assaults he's and he's the man leading the defense against the bashi bazooks but the janissaries have got, like, this is one of the things that, you know we, we we often think of the ottomans as the sort of uh, as the more backward army compared to the europeans but, but they, they were are not. great pioneers of yeah. of of artillery artillery regimental discipline of tactics and handguns yeah, yeah. They had the first guns. first army to have massive handguns, uh, and this is what this is what Justiani is. Uh, oh, he's shot uh, by. Is, is yes, shot of by. course. Yeah. A handgun. Yes, I don't know why I was sort of thinking of one of those sort of old-fashioned long muskets. So yes, you're right. I mean, it's, it's something something quite different. So okay, so he falls. There is now despondency. So he falls, and he's and he's carried he's carried to his boat, and they see they're seen, and so this is it. You know, the the, the main man, our main protector, is leaving. What hope is there now? What is the emperor, the the forty eight year old Paleologus, the last man standing? What is he doing while all hell is breaking loose around him? So he comes up and he tries to beg Justiniani not to retreat to his boat. He says, "If you go, we're lost." But he's in such terrific pain. I mean, it's not it's no fun to be shot. Uh, and he's bleeding everywhere. And he says, just take me to my boat. I'm finished. This is me now. And, he, and he's screaming agony. He, he, he's having a, uh, he knows he's dying. Yeah. Um, and his departure panics the defenders. And they fatally leave. They've, there's been a little sort of side gate called the Kirka Porta, uh, which the defenders have been using to mount assaults on the troops. They've been whipping out of this and, and doing these little side attacks on, on, on the Janissaries. Little crack squads going out. Yeah, huh? Uh-huh. And in the panic, when Justiniani is taken to his boat, they leave the door open. Can you believe it? This vital moment. And the Ottomans spot this. The Janissaries spot this, and they get in there. They break in. And the person who is immediately summoned is of course the last emperor himself, the great Constantine. And I have to, I'm afraid, I, have, I know you're bored of Runciman now, but. I'm not bored of Runciman. I, but can I just say, I love the way you love Runciman. I love Runciman. <laughs> it's really, it so sweet. <laughs> Go on then, hit us with some Runciman. They dismounted, and for a few minutes, the four of them held the approach to the gate through which Justiani had just been carried. But the defense was broken now. The gate was jammed with Christian soldiers trying to make their escape as more and more Janissaries fell on them. Theophilus shouted that he'd rather die than live and disappeared into the oncoming hordes. Constantine himself knew now that the empire was lost and he had no wish to survive it. He flung off his imperial regalia and with Don Francisco and John Dalmata still at his side, he followed Theophilus. He was never seen again. Oh, wow. Oh, that is a fact. Eventually, when he's um, when he's his body is found, he's recognised only by his purple shoes. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and there then follows, you know, as any in any pre-modern war, uh, uh, I suppose, even in a modern war, when it, when a city falls, it's a terrible it's thing. A sacking of a city, and how does it look? How does that feel in Constantinople? What happens to the city? So the rules of war at this point, and there are rules of war even in uh, even at this period of history, and the rules are that if a city resists and does not surrender, it can be sacked for three days. Right. And in those three days, the attackers have got the right to do what they what they like. They can seize anything, they can rape whoever they want, uh, they can take slaves, they can. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a, it's all that pre modern horror can possibly imagine, and. The troops crash into the city. A few galleys escapes. Some of the Genoese, including Justiniani's galley, manages to get away. Justiniani dies. But those who don't escape and are found in the, street, in the, in the streets are enslaved. And there's massacre in quarter after quarter, deeper and deeper into the city as the Janissaries and the other troops uh, head. Uh, it's, it's about, what, four miles from the land walls to the, uh, to the point of Hagia Sophia. Uh, and no quarter is given to man or woman, old or young, commoner or aristocrat. And quite a few people hide in the great church of Hagia Sophia because there's a, there's a prophecy that if, uh, if the city falls, um, people will be safe in Hagia Sophia. So lots and lots of people, including cr- crowds of women and monks, pour into the church. But even that is, is not sacrosanct. And terrible scenes of rape and pillage and, and murder take place in Hagia Sophia. 
And there's a, there's a description which is blood flowed in the city like rainwater in gutters after a sudden storm. So you get the mm. idea. So, yeah, I mean, I, I, this is um, audio, so you can't see, but we both did a shudder at the same time just because. Just, just imagine. Now, listen, in all this time, we've talked about Constantine, who has died and is only recognisable by his purple shoes. His purple socks. <laughs> his purple, purple shoes. socks. Purple his purple socks. shoes. Oh, okay. But what? where is Mehmed the second? Because, I mean, I, it, it, anyone who imagines that he's been on the front line directing his troops, that's not how it's happened. I mean, he's, he's a 21, 20, 21 year old who has just planned this and is calmly waiting like a chess player. He's not there on the front, is he? But he does arrive now. He arrives, he comes through the conquered city, and he breaks the rules of war by declaring the pillage to be at an end on the evening of day one. He's so impressed with the defenders that anyone who is not already captured uh, and is already not already a slave is free to continue in the city. Uh, and he spares anyone who is still alive. And he then rides all the way into the city to the great church of Iosophia, the main church of the Orthodox world. He dismounts. He covers his turban with dirt as a sign of humility. And then he walks into the church and declares it to be a mosque and declares himself to be the new Caesar of the Romans. He likes to see himself not as a, a foreign figure. He wants to take on the mantle of Rome, the successor of Constantine. So he, end, he orders an end to the slaughter. He says any churches which have been taken should be given back. And this is why Constantinople, in his reign, continues with a Greek majority. Yes. And, and far from sort of, you know, the, the picture that's painted of him by um, contemporaries, like there's a, a man called Dukas, who is absolutely insistent that he is the Antichrist and writes about him as if this is now the reign of the Antichrist. This is a, a time for the city which is rich in many cultures many faiths, many peoples who, who come and, and are able to exist within the walls. Um, we're going to discover more about this in the next episode because, you know, the siege itself suggests as if this is a great defeat of Christianity by Islam. But as our next guest, Mark David Baer, the, the, who is an expert on the history of the Ottomans, is going to show us, it actually turns out to be a lot less confrontational, a lot more integrated with the history of Europe than the story of the siege would lead us to suspect. It is. And this is a very important point that when they want to refill the city, who is it they get in to do? They bring in the Jews who the Europeans have expelled from Granada, from Spain, and who have been uh, given refuge in Salonika. And he brings the, the Salonika Jews into Istanbul to fill the quarters. And so it's complicated. It's a complicated story. I mean, it's, yeah. it's not a pretty sight. There is rape, there is loot, there is pillage. Hundreds of slaves are led off at this point. But the city is not gutted. The city is uh, will, by the end of Mehmet's reign, be larger and fuller and richer and more bustling than it has been at any point since the 12th century. And nonetheless, this is one of the kind of crucial turning points of history. Europe is completely shocked. Surprisingly, they hadn't seen it coming. They thought, you know, we've had, there'd been many scrapes before. But it's not like they haven't been told. I mean, the poor Byzantines have been, you know, hammering on their, their doors for, for almost 100 years saying, this is coming. This is getting really bad now. This is coming. And even now, there's no crusade. Um, Europe just sort of shrugs and takes it. For the Greeks... This is the beginning of uh, you know a long period of, of domination by the Ottomans, and you will never find any Greek anywhere who has a, a good word to say about the Turks uh, to this day. It is it's one of those big wounds in history, unhealed, like I, I suppose like India and Pakistan. Look at Cyprus, Greek Greek Cypriots, Cypriots and Turkish Cypriots. I mean, yep. you see you see it sort of played out as a line, not in the sand, but through a country. But the, the other big thing, of course, is is Russia. Russia now sees itself uh, as the last surviving pillar of orthodoxy. Rome was the first Rome. Constantinople was the second Rome. Moscow now regards itself as the third Rome. And they see themselves now as the last surviving true Christians, uh, the last orthodox, not, not under captivity. Well, listen, I, ho I hope you agree that the Ottomans is a really interesting, a really interesting chapter in history and one that has deep roots but also tall branches that, that reach into our 
present day. So look, join us again next week where Mark Baer is going to be our very special guest. Mark is a fantastic guest. I read his book. I reviewed his book when it came out last year. And then I got him to the Jaipur Festival. And he's a wonderful speaker. So I think we're going to be in for a real treat. And he, he he's one, I mean, very, very few people today can read Ottoman Turkish. Of course, when Ataturk took over the, the state, the Republic of Turkey in the 1920s, he changed the script to a Latin script. So all modern Turks now grow up uh, using the Latin script and, and very few people can read Ottoman manuscripts. Mark David Bear is one of them. He spent long years in Top Kapi working away on the Ottoman records. And this is his first book that pulls it all together. And it's, it's a cracker. So uh, I think we're in for a very, very exciting episode next week. Until then, it's goodbye from me. And goodbye from me. <laughs> I don't get to say my name this time. Well, you can, do you want to? Okay, I'm not going to. The, the man goodbye of the false from, ending. Hang on a minute. Goodbye from me, <laughs> William Dalrymple. <laughs> Is that who you are? And goodbye from me, Anita Arnold. And we're definitely going for a cappuccino. 